1999, police in Snowtown, Australia, made the horrifying discovery of eight dismembered bodies in barrels. These killings became known as the Snowtown Murders, one of the most famous cases of serial killers in Australia. These murders were attributed to John Bunting, Robert Wagner, James Vlasakis and Mark Hayden. There haven't been many Australian serial killers who have murdered as prolifically as Bunting and his gang, nor as heinously. Their victims were their own family members and friends who they often tortured before death. Most of the killers have never shown remorse and the little town has forever been scarred. As you learn more about these murders in Snowtown, keep in mind that these killers are all behind bars and still alive. There may be more victims that authorities do not know about yet. The victims of the group of murderers rarely die quickly. Police recovered the following tools that were used to torture the victims. Knives, saws, a double barrel shotgun, rope, tape, gloves, pliers, clamps, cloth, and even a variac metallurgy tool that was used to give electric shocks to the genitals and other parts of the victims. One of the killers later confessed about how the tools were used and it did not paint a pretty picture. Ray Davies was garroted with a rope and a lever after he was put into a bath. Before he died, they attacked him with clubs and beat his genitals. They even crushed one of his toes with a pair of pliers just to make him suffer. Another victim, Frederick Brooks, was given electric shocks to his testicles and had a lit sparkler shoved into his penis. His toes were also crushed with pliers and his nose and ears were burnt with cigarettes. Eventually, they stuffed a rag in his mouth and just let him choke to death. All the while, these two men and other victims were forced to call their killers different titles such as God, Master, Lord Sir and Chief Inspector. The final victim that was killed before police got wind to this murderous gang was David Johnson, James Flasaki's stepbrother. Johnson was lured to an empty bank building by Flasaki's, where Bunting and Wagner lay in wait. Once there, Johnson was strangled, handcuffed and forced to read a script for a recording. He recited confessions of crimes and acts he had not done and gave his financial information. The killers had done this before with the other victims. Then, Wagner and Vlasakis left Bunting alone with Johnson to try, unsuccessfully, to access Johnson's funds through an ATM. When they returned, he was dead. But Wagner wasn't done yet. He said he was upset that he hadn't got to play with Johnson, so he thought he would have a little more fun. When they dismembered Johnson, they took parts of his flesh, fried them, and ate them together as one more means of having fun. Despite the name Snowtown Murders, Johnson is the only victim to have actually died in Snowtown. Historically, prolific serial killers tend to work alone because it affords them a smaller chance of getting caught. This was not at all the case for the Snowtown Murders. There was a ringleader who pushed for and arranged all the killings and he enlisted not one, but three other people to regularly help with the crimes as well as a few others. John Bunting, the one in charge, approached his neighbour, Robert Wagner, as a friend and eventually roped him into murder. Bunting was married to Elizabeth Harvey and through her met her son, James Vlasakis. Vlasakis would help with and suggest later killings. Mark Hayden also lived nearby and became friends with Bunting and was eventually drawn into the circle of murders. In addition to these four main players, there were other accomplices. Bunting's wife, Elizabeth Harvey, also assisted in at least one of the murders. Thomas Trevelyan was initially part of the gang as well, but later became a victim. Jody Elliott was a relative of Mark Hayden and was also helping out, collecting money after the killings. With all these people involved in the murders, it's shocking the operation went on for as many years as it did. The ringleader of these murderous operations was John Bunting and you'd be hard pressed to find a better killer gang leader. He was characterized as a good listener, kind, compassionate and empowering. He had a knack for talking to people, befriending them and making them feel so connected to him that they would do just about anything he asked of them. 
However, underneath that kind and unassuming appearance lay all the classic earmarks for a serial killer. He'd been abused as a youth and became fascinated with weaponry and causing pain. He killed a friend's dog, became fascinated with anatomy and began working in a crematorium with human bodies. He killed and skinned cats, bragged about how much he enjoyed slaughtering animals while working at the meat company. In summary, he was a master manipulator, obsessed with death and had a love of killing. It was a perfect storm that resulted in a terrifying serial killer. One particularly terrifying aspect of these killings is that many of the victims were not kidnapped and killed elsewhere, as many serial killers do. Instead, the murderers often chose to kill people within their own homes. Elizabeth Hayden, Gary O'Dwyer, Troy Ude, and perhaps some of the others were all killed in their place of living, or were at least attacked and tortured there. What's more is that the group of killers would vandalise the homes of their victims, as well as the homes of anyone they thought might be gay or a pedophile. They showed no fear of intruding or disrupting someone else's privacy, and did so easily without getting caught. Those that were not killed in their homes were often lured willingly to Bunting's house where they were tormented and murdered before their bodies were dismembered and stuffed into barrels. Bunting hadn't exactly had an easy life while growing up. He was born without a sense of smell at the young age of eight. He was brutally beaten and sexually assaulted by a friend's older brother. It is likely that set him on a path of harbouring a deep hatred for pedophiles and gays. Later down the line, he would use this hatred as an excuse to begin killing. His first victim, Clinton Trezias, was one he accused of being a pedophile. After he had invited the man over for a social visit, he accused him of crimes against children. Then he bashed in Trezias's head with a shovel before disposing of his body. Bunting would later refer to Trezias as happy pants, but there is no actual evidence that Clinton was a pedophile. Bunting's hatred of gays didn't extend to any actual crimes. He considered them dirty, and in one room of his home, he created what he called a rock spider wall, where he kept a web of pictures and names of people he suspected were gays. Rock spider is a slang term in Australia for pedophiles, where he referred to all gays as such. It's not common for prolific serial killers to kill people they know or are close to because it brings investigators knocking at their doors. If someone you know dies, police tend to question you and that can lead to you becoming a suspect or giving away a hint as to what happened to them. But in this case, the gang went out of their way to get to know the people they killed and oftentimes these people were friends and family for quite some time before Bunting ever made the call that they needed to be killed. Some even lived with Bunting for a time, such as Gavin Porter and Thomas Trevelyan. The killers got close to Trezise and Barry Lane for a time before they killed them. Trevelyan had even assisted in a previous murder before Bunting decided he was the next mark. Many of the people they killed had psychiatric problems or mental disabilities, which made them easy targets and meant they were not missed as quickly. But even then, some of these individuals had known the killers for years, or even their whole lives. For example, Elizabeth Hayden was the wife of one of the killers, and David Johnson was a stepbrother of Vasiliki's. A few of the victims were actually family members, particularly family members of James Vasiliki's. James was only in his teens at the time, and easily fell under Bunting's spell. He was quick to offer up people for him to kill. Bunting had married Elizabeth Harvey, James' mother, and the two quickly began to spend a lot of time together. Without a present father in his life, James turned to Bunting as a father figure and began to trust him and make attempts to impress him. When Bunting said he hated gays and pedophiles, James was quick to agree. He even confided that his half-brother Troy Ude had molested him when he was only 13 years old. Bunting responded by setting up Ude's murder. The group visited Ude's house, dragged him from his bed, tormented him, then killed him and disposed of his body. David Johnson, James' own stepbrother, later became a victim as well. Not all the bodies were disposed of the same way. 
but the majority of them were dismembered and buried in a very particular manner. In May of 1999, police discovered the remains of eight victims stored in huge plastic barrels of acid in a shed. Sometimes, two bodies were shoved into a single barrel. After the dismembered bodies were stored, Bunting would often check on them to see how they were doing. Upon looking at the first victims he put in those barrels, he reportedly said, they're rotting very nicely. He took some pleasure in watching the bodies of the victims fall apart in the barrels, and he kept two barrels separate from the others in the abandoned bank vault where he had killed Johnson. This grisly find by the police led to the murders often being referred to as the bodies in the barrels case. One of the last victims that was killed before the police caught on was the wife of one of the killers, Elizabeth Hayden. Bunting and Wagner went over to her house while she was alone, when her children and husband were out. Bunting claims that she behaved very sexually towards them. This meant that she was dirty and treacherous and needed to die. She was tortured and killed in her own home before her body was put in a barrel. When Mark was later shown his wife's remains in the barrel, he supposedly laughed and did not appear upset. Fortunately, she was close enough to the group that her disappearance alerted the police to the fact that something might be up. A year later, in 1999, the group was caught and arrested after the bodies were found. In the end, 12 bodies were found. Only 11 could be determined as murdered, but there may have been even more victims.